I'm right here on time. No, no, we're perfectly on time. We're going to start at this moment. So let me tell you that we are going to be recording the seminar so that later we can have the possibility to access to it. And before we start, we I want to tell you that we have simultaneous interpretation for those of you who are interested. We also have people from other countries. So you you'll find the interpretation button just if you need it. Let me introduce myself. I'm Angela Maria Amaya. I am a lawyer. I'm a researcher at Externado University and I'm part of the International Corporation of the Environmental Law Institute from the United States and the uh, GGGI. So within the framework of uh, international cooperation that we have with the judicial branch, we are in charge of supporting uh, judges who know all about deforestation cases. So the main objective has been this judicial training with national and international experts on these um, tools or abilities to get to know about difficult cases uh, in different jurisdictions. So within the framework of this, we have had different ones. We have had environmental jurisdiction with the prosecutor's office, and we have supported at different points in time in these processes to prepare laws. We supported Juan Carlos Lozada with some comments from uh, international experts, then uh, environmental jurisdiction, and so on. The project has linked or has uh, joined uh, Colombian reality to support the dynamic. This webinar that we are having today is the first out of three that will have the following three Thursdays, I mean, today and tomorrow, within these international corporations. So this politics dialogue, it aims at having spaces where we can interact. We have people that work in the everyday lives, a Congress people from the general attorney's office. We want judges, of course, and we want to have discussion spaces taking advantage of virtual meetings that we have now. So before we start, I would like to recommend or invite you to the next two webinars that we're going to have a week from today. At the same time, we're going to be telling you about the information and even in the chat, and we will have these on environmental legal clinics. Those institutions, when training lawyers, protecting the environment with experts from two of the legal clinics, the most prestigious ones in the United States, and two of the most prestigious ones in Colombia, not only universities, but from non NGOs. NGOs. The third webinar that'll be November 4th is on environmental justice, taking this additional space. So for, for justice, so, so these procedural substantial needs. So we're moving towards more towards um, this discussion. I don't want to take any more time from our panelists. Your questions are welcome. This is a space to get to know and to present this new law. This has been a milestone and so important for the country, this modification of the uh, criminal code. That's why we invited Juan Carlos Lozada so that he can introduce the, the the reason of being for this law for our countries. We also have Jose Junis from the Amazonian uh, Vision and Daniel Cardona from Externado University. From the academic pers perspective, Madeline Paris from the prosecutor's office, this perspective, uh, illegal uh, behaviors against the environment, and Jessica Storino, one of our star judges. And she'll tell us uh, from the judicial perspective. I'm going to be intense with time. So please uh, comply with the time allotted. No further be said. Thank you for connecting and take advantage of these events. Today, the following two Thursdays, Mr. Lozada, you have the floor. 10 minutes, I'm going to be telling you 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Angela Maria. Hello to the panelists, other panelists. Thank you so much for the invitation. All opportunities that we have to share our environmental law is absolutely welcome. It is a key job to do it the way you have done it for so long, having pedagogy on environmental topics with uh, the judges 
uh, I hope that this can be done, Carl, with the general attorney's office, right? We have spoken with the general attorney of the nation and uh, some, time, some days ago, and I take advantage of this moment to try to build that bridge. We have Madeline here and she perfectly knows that this is a very important task. Well, first, I'd like to say that the intention, we have this structural reform to Title 11 of the Criminal Code is to update that title to the reality our country lives in terms of environmental crimes. That's why the focus of this reform, the way we proposed it beyond modifications we had, is related to the creation of three new criminal types. Some of them in in existent in the previous code, others acquire this status of autonomous crimes out of the Ill illegal use of natural resources. This crime used to comprise many of these, but it was vague, right? The way I see it. And I believe that the, the illegal use of natural resources needed to be specified in the real problems in the territories in our country. That's the reason why we uh, proposed the deforestation crime and the new brother crime, which is financing deforestation. Colombia is the second country with the greatest biodiversity in the planet. However, deforestation has hit our country tremendously. It is very worrying. Just in 2017, just to give you a number, more than 220,000 hectares of native forest were deforest, were, uh, had deforestation. In the last five years, just to mention one concrete place, now that Mr. Junis is here, between Picachus, Macarena, mountain range, and of course the north, Chiribiquete Park. So in just in this past five years, more than half a million hectares that have been in deforestation. Well, they, the national agency for land has not recovered one square meter of one, half a million hectares. You see Dr. Junis, how in this region, probably we have four, five, six of the 12 municipalities where EDM has been able to identify where most deforestation is, Cartagena del Chaira, San Vicente del Caguan, del Caguan, Miraflores. Madeline knows perfectly about that case, how those two majors uh, agreed on building a road without an environmental license. And there was 38,000 hectares were in deforestation in just one year. Dramatic cases like Mapiripan, one village where recently there was deforestation for almost about 10,000 hectares. Well, it, it, rumors has it between three, th 3 million and 5 million per hectare. Who has the capacity to pay three to five million per hectare to have this magnitude of operation? It's not just two or three peasants who agreed on doing this. There is this criminal ban, and we need to go after those criminal gangs. And this law for environmental crimes, it does not only typify it as a crime, and it is more strict even with those who finance deforestation, but it provides tools for the general attorney's office different to the ones that it had before to take them into jail. You, it was to capture someone in Guaviare and to be able to have him according to the law to have this guarantee control judge. It was just an impossible task. Those people were always ended up free. So that's why we extended those terms, understanding the complexity of regions where these crimes are occurring. If I had to say what the nutshell uh, for this environmental law is no doubt the creation of illegal uh, taking lands 
uh, from the nation. That is the, the deep cause for deforestation, the deep cause for war in our country. So to attack those who deliberately make up a crime, a gang, so to take all Colombians land, they are the only guarantee and the possibility to have that bank, land bank that is in point number one of the Havana Accords, which is a comprehensive rural reform. Well, this is only the possibility that we have to come out of deforestation and violence in Colombia. And of course, the brother crime financing or promoting of the, of the use or appropriation of lands from the nation, well, is key because those intellectual actors, those who are paying peasants so that they go for the land, so that they have the first issue, so that they log and they keep land in Colombia, those are the first ones who have to be behind bars. Then we wanted to turn this wild fauna crime, right, traffic, so there is no doubt this is one of the worst crimes that we have in Colombia and, this, and nobody speaks about that. We're the second country that exports animals to other countries. Numbers say in the national police that they seize 36,000 animals per year. And for each one of those seized, those that have grabbed it from traffickers, there must be 10 we didn't know about. So just capturing one or seizing one out of 10, nine are free, nine are exported. So these species are affected and there is this terrible case for animal mistreatment and those crimes. I also created this uh, crime, uh, this mistreat crime. Well, there are many other measures we provided the General Attorney's Office strengthening uh, for this task. More than 175 will be, their charges will be there against environmental crimes. And this is a key point, which I believe that we cannot leave aside. I believe that I already learned the lesson. Just having a law without having institutionality for it to be correctly applied is the same as doing nothing. That's why I have fought so much so that the General Attorney's Office created the group for against uh, animal mistreatments for this law 74, 1574, so that we included in this law institutionality that the General Attorney's Office requires to be able to apply this law. So that's why we created this specialized team inside the General Attorney's Office to investigate these environmental crimes. I know that I have one minute, 11 seconds left. So dear Angela, <laughs> my professor, yes, I'm sorry to, be, to call you so familiar. I know that you're gonna be very strict with time, you said so. So I'd like to stop there. And of course, I'm here just to go into debate about other aspects of the law. I know that Daniel, Carl, Madeline, and, uh, and as Mrs. Estorino will touch on in a deeper way, they will delve on it and say, hi, Dr. Junis, and to continue conversing about this. And just to say in those 30 seconds that I have let, left, Dr. Angela, that this is not gonna solve the deforestation problem in Colombia. We need state policy so that communities who live in that sector of the country to understand forest can produce wealth. There is no need just to log it as a way to progress, but forest economy in our country has to grow and there needs to be credit lines so that that forest can be used in the best way. Oh, look, my alarm went off. Okay, so <laughs> I just want to close by saying that this is just one mechanism to fight against uh, these problems that we have in our nature in this crucial moment that we have to face the worst crisis, no doubt is the climate crisis. And this needs to be complemented with many other policies that can have 
um, they don't see any other possibilities than deforestation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lozada. For us, it is a privilege to have this panel, these uh, experts that we have here today. If you could, could, you can stay in the questions and answer session. We can answer live. And just to let you know, I see the list of assistants. We have masters, students, professors, investigators. So that's what we want. We want to have academic discussion at all levels we can. Now I'm going to pass on the floor to Mr. Junis. We know that it's a complex moment, so go ahead. First of all, hello, Juan Carlos, Madeleine, everyone. I am at the airport. I apologize. I am going to, first of all, like Juan Carlos said, this is not the solution. This is just one part of the solution. Some of them were needed in the country, but of of course, because of the forestation phenomenon is more complex and it will require many tools like the ones that we have in the Amazon vision. So I just wanted to point out, we have these implications for this crime law. I wanna show a slide. I think it's very important, very relevant. Can, can you see it, please? I think I'm projecting. I think this is the perspective what I wanna show. Can you see it? Yes, we see it perfectly well. Thank you. Okay, great. So Juan Carlos, these are the historic numbers of deforestation in Colombia in the past 20 years. We have exact data. This is not a dimension. This is not approximate. This is the historical figures. At the beginning, we had the monitoring um, system that started in, in 2000 in dark green. Like Mr. Lozada said, in 2017, we had 220,000 hectares. We see it right here. And then it started lowering. It went up here. And we're about right here in 145,000 at the national level, but 103 in the Amazon. I'm sorry, 2020, 109 and 171. Because besides the importance of forcing Colombia, first history, the average, when you have it, is 150,000. Some years more, some years left. In the Amazon, we have about 87,000, meaning 66% in the Amazon. So this graph is so important here because it comes from the next two periods. So what does it mean to come to the forestation? Well, this is simulated, but we would have in the next administration, we would have to go 30, 40%. And the next, the following administration would have to go three to 40 percent. Uh, the last mile would be more difficult to end up with probably around 40,000 heg. And then we would have to restore 40,000 to be able to get to net zero. This is the perspective. Perspective. Why do I talk about it? This is an important tool that we have the environmental crime and we'll see the impacts and effects here. We will see impacts here or carbon markets or economic alternatives that we'll see. This is Colombia's perspective, the one that we need to have in the midterm, not long-term, midterm. Good news. The good news is that we have identified when, when, how it happens, and 80% happens in these regions in red. But I want you, I want you to know that taking these uh, soils, they happen from two to five hectares in this one, five to ten, these places, ten to twenty, these ones, twenty, thirty, thirty, fifty, and more than fifty. All those more than 50 are located in the Amazon and just a little bit in San Lucas and Catatumbo. So it means that if Colombia is located and it fights for deforestation in this nuclear, it would have 70 and 80 percent, it would tackle 7, 80 percent deforestation. Well, thanks to IDEAM, thanks to the efforts, all this system in deforestation nucleus, what municipalities and what villages we, I, I didn't, I'm not showing villages here, but we also have it. Well, in Amazon, we already know the greatest. Uh, Mr. Lozada talked about Mapiripan. Look at it right here. They have low income there. Uh, yeah, so 
this this the one that we have in Mapiripan is not only those eight thousand or ten thousand, but it also represents that percentage. So we would have cost effectiveness to work here because the criminal part has to be well the, but more some places are more cost effective than in others well i bring this graph why it is why we have to be very efficient in where we have our processes if this is mapiripan town and we have like one mayor one priest some we can have some institutionality but come from here this is 30 kilometers where do we have deforestation in those remote areas more difficult to get? It's not right there by the city. So those are more difficult to access. I'm missing one of them. But here we have to pay attention to the logistics and where we have efforts because it is more difficult to locate. In this analysis that we have kept in mind, we have expressed deforestation from 20, 2019 to 2020 and others that we're going to have later on. We have 4,091 polygons. It implies 60,000 hectares in the Amazon. Out of those 4,091 polygons, if we were to with 195 right here, the low percentile of more than 50 hectares, we would have 30% of deforestation. So there is this average of 93.82 hectares. That's the average. So if we work with the small ones, let's say from zero to 10 polygons, we're talking about 100, excuse me, 11,000 hectares, almost 60% polygons. So those that are less, uh, two, five to 10. So we just only capture 18%. And the other two percentiles are divided the same way. So if you cross it, the table uh, half, and this is high class, high deforestation, and this lower deforestation, they are divided the same way. But well, where to have efforts? This is efficiency and efficacy as well. Well, these tables, Mapiripan, like the Senator mentioned, we have 80,000 deforestation, 199 polygons, 42 deforested, 5,000, and the other 1,134, there is a crime, somebody's having appropriations. This is in Uribe Meta. Those polygons of less than 10 hectares, two hectares, that's more social. You need to understand the phenomenon. We, we have to go in with alternatives, control and surveillance, but this is more social. So from 452, just 135 in the area. So just to know where it's happening. Look at the graphs. Mr. Lozada mentioned it. This is Mapiripan. Somebody is having a lot. So that's where something is going on. And that's where we have to locate those efforts. But if you go to Camuya, let's pay attention to this bottom part. We see that we have great deforestation. But to get there, let me go back. I'm sorry. So to get there is to get here. It is a remote area, very difficult area. So if we have operations, if we have control for criminal and a crime, then it, it would have to be done in a clear, efficient way because it is very costly and uh, well efficient. If you get to those areas and if you speak in other about other contexts, for example, Raihi and Yurija, Alto, Imputo Mayo, here we have the identification. We don't have a lot of hoarding, but there is co cocaine right there. So so that's so what Mr. Lozada said is financers, people that are having money here and there. So that's why criminal types and crimes are important. There are new um, legal actions, new criminal types. We need to appropriate this. So there is this part that is related to culture, resistance, uh, social manifestations. This is going to be a difficult path, but it's sometimes this will be one of the challenges that we have. And that's why we need education on deforestation as a crime, not only with judges or investigators, but sometimes people think that that's fine, but we have this criminal type that says that this is not tolerable and this is not acceptable. Greater resources are needed because with this phenomenon, we need to have consistency, coherence, persistence when investigating crimes and to combat deforestation. Well, they're complex. There are 
there are connections there we have hoarding um, others are related with uh, flow, capital flow money laundering specialized ones there has to be understanding of the criminal type which makes it more complex since this is a since this is an extended phenomenon this needs to be prioritized we need to have telling processes clear processes so that we tell people this happens and then someone is actually sentenced in Mapi in Mapiripan and so people say hey justice is working so that's why we need to be very efficient in logistics and investigation because these places are remote areas eight ten hours from the nearest town so you need to go with certain logistics and you need to explain that needs to be explained now but the forestation phenomenon is not only tackled with crime this is the last thing you want you don't want to get to to the general attorney's office this is just one tool but there are so many others offer social alternatives just like the ones that we have in this program we have like 8000 peasants with credits and payment payment for environmental services uh the forest uh, no class development Nucleus development. So that's the one that we need to have in the Amazon, which we, we needs to have a forest model. Everything that goes against the forest should not go. And whatever goes against it needs to be reconverted. This is a marathon, a sprint. We need to have these processes so that show results effective and say, ah, they caught that guy, the one with a lot of resources, but the ones that are have low resources as well. So it's not just the top guys, but the bottom part guys as well. So these are the thoughts that I wanted to share with you just to show you the complexity, the phenomenon. It is an extensive region getting to certain areas. There are no roads. Deforestations are three, four hours of some places, others not so far. So this will require integrality and this persistent effort throughout years. Thank you so much. Gracias, Jose, for your intervention. The problem that like, yeah, so, this is not just a law about deforestation. Well, this is the, the problem that is part of, of these. So we have seen the, the need, the criminal type in deforestation, and now we're going to move to a section, a more academic section, a concrete analysis from criminal discipline. Well, Daniel, he speaks in the international project and so that you can tell us about, I mean, your perceptions, a law, an initiative like this is not going to be, I mean, nobody, yeah, not everyone is going to see it with the same eye. So that's what it is about. It's about those shadows and the lights. So with this academic discussion, respectful, as well, very, very important questions, like seeing things from the both sides of the coin. Daniel, if you see questions that you can answer, panelists, please go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Jose. Thank you, Jose. Oh, we did it. Great. All right. Let me introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I am Daniel Cardona. I am a lawyer. Uh, from external de Colombia. Do you see the, my screen? We see it, but there, 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 there. Yeah. Magister in criminal sciences, a consultant, and I was also between 2016 and 2020, I was a specialized prosecutor and then delegate before the tribunal. So, Thank you so much for the invitation, Carl, Environmental Law Institute, Angela, thank you for your invitation. And uh, taking advantage of the of Los our representative is to have an approximation to criminal types that were created, modifications that we had about those existing types and having some critic, some, I would like to have to think about challenges, discussions when applying these criminal types. We don't aim at having this criminal law course, but we are going to touch on the most important points, looking at modifications for this law, 2111. Okay, 
we agree and we say that criminal law has to regulate the way it has been done for some years on environmental issues because continuity of our species is there at stake. Future generations, we can have a space where we can live. If we look at law 2111, we have these big groups. So the whole chapter related to criminal types that go against the natural resources and the environment and others, other determinations that are related to competence of specialized judges, about some of the crimes and some uh, patrimony measures that are going to be discussed. We're going to discuss them and there's this is structure inside the general attorney's office. And I share, I share that appreciation from Mr. Loza, his comment to give this structure so that we can have a specialized group inside the general attorney's office so that we, uh, they, they can look at those more important topics. Not everything should fall there because then we're going to have a bottleneck. But we must have in this specialized unit, those prioritized cases, those most important cases. So from there, we can have impacts required by the country in its fight against environmental crimes. Let's go to the first chapter. So we have illegal use of natural resources. Then modifications are uh, broadened. So, so we have verbs, our new verbs, uh, access, capture, extract. There is a discussion in, in judicial practice. There is this clause, open clause, almost in their indetermined clause and for those that say that, that in any other way benefits, right? Quote, quote. There could be discussions about constitutionality of this provision because of it, the fact that it is not determined, right? There are some material objects are broadened and there is also this discussion. With this writing, with this wording, we have this, is, is the, are we affecting the principle of minimum intervention? We have this uh, be, crime against, well, this behavior that is not generating minimum uh, points as to when criminal law should intervene. This second crime, fauna traffic, this is new, along with what uh, Lozada, Mr. Lozada told us. This is specific types, and this is an example. And then we have here verbs, main verbs, and we have those uh, crimes, but the sentences, whether we should have this conditional, this conditional suspension. You could at the beginning think that it shouldn't because the minimum sentence is 60 years, but because of anticipated end of the process or to accept charges, pre-agreements, it could be under 48 months. So we're not 60 months, 48 months. So that, yeah. We have here illegal hunting. On the left, well, I'm sorry, there is this, this, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's wrong here on the slide. Old text, new text. So before we had minimum salaries and now we have more salaries, right? So it's 33, from 33 to 937 minimum legal salary salary yeah no other point besides that let's talk about illegal fishing we have other verbs we see a material objects or substantial objects and here we establish that we have this crime when those methods or or uh, those methods that are non-authorized are used. So we can determine when we are having this criminal type in subsist subsistence fishing is not a crime as long as it uh, goes by the law. Illegal handling of exotic species. This is a new type. 
what the main verbs are. And here, this is something that is important. Different from what happened with some of the criminal types that we have seen before, we need to see how when we describe material object, it tells us one object we have here, exotic wild species. So it seems that it must have both conditions, both wild and exotic, right? So the way it was described, then we see, we know that there will be application problems when we are facing species that could be considered exotic, but are they wild or not? Are they invasive uh, species? So this discussion about material objects can bring discussions into in the practice. And we're gonna see how jurisprudence de uh, develops this. I think that is important to have a specificity about this, the description of material object as it was done in some previous criminal types, deforestation. One of the main points of this law and then how it is create, how we have this type, deforestation, is just not any type of logging. There are minimum criteria for it to be criminal interest, and we celebrate that because it's not that criminal law is going to act against any logging or fire activity, but it is reserved for those cases in which that deforestation activity goes beyond or goes past a hectare. So activities where there is this area below that, they're going to be competence of only administrative law. So it's important to highlight that that area could be continuous or non-continuous. And uh, certain circumstances are established. There is also this criminal type, which is deforestation promotion and financing. Okay, what we have here is the activity for those who are providing those technical means, economic means that uh, provide for this deforestation activity. The question was, was this type necessary? The discussion is there if we keep in mind the definitions that we have in the criminal code as to who are authors, co-authors, participation, or accomplice, accomplices. So one could say that these types of activities were already covered by those that we already had in had in authority, authority and participation. The question we have is about how there is this crime, higher crime, for those who are in financing, promoting, than for those who are actually developing or doing the activity for this forestation. Here, it starts in 96 months. And if we go back to, to our crime, we have here, the sentence is 60, right? 60 months for just the forestation. So one starts looking with certain concern from this dogmatic perspective, from this academic perspective, you see the way in which there is this criteria that we already have in the criminal code is broken when we have co-author or when we talk about like determination or accomplices or the sentences that are established here. Here, we're generating these greater uh, sentences for those who are not developing deforestation activity, but promoting and financing it. And these could generate discussions because of proportionality. What is worse, for someone to promote it or for someone to is actually developing this activity? So this is just to criticize from uh, an academic perspective. We have illicit use and management of genetically modified organisms. The sentence is broadened. 
So those are the most important ones. In relation to this criminal type, we already had a similar type before law 2111. So illegal exploitation of mining reservoirs and other materials, no, not many changes are seen here. Let's go to the chapter number two. This is related to natural resources damage. So damage to natural resources and ecocide. So here we have this discussion. When Once we check the description, when you incur in natural resource damage before the paragraph, there is no reference to massification criteria, generalized destruction or systematic destruction, meaning this type for natural resources does not demand those elements. Therefore, the discussion that comes up is when in the first paragraph, they start describing ecocides. What implications does this have in the end? It's not that when you have a massive damage, generalized grave, I mean, in systematic damage, you're gonna have a greater one. We just have a description from the discussion that is happening in the environmental, in the, I'm sorry, international scope for the need to protect the environment, to avoid damage to natural resources, and how on some occasions it could be considered as a, a hardcore crime in international law because of these criteria on massification. But in the end, when we sit down and we check in detail, it won't have the specific consequence for it to be before this situation that is called ecocide, environmental pollution. Here we have some interesting discussions. We need to point out first, number six, when there is aggravation. This is when pollution is because of the storing, uh, transport, or drainage of uh, waste or this dangerous waste. These substitutes or the, the previous type is substituted with solid waste within these circumstances that we have here. Okay, so we have this discussion surrounding number three of these circumstances because it says that the census will be increased when the natural person, especially when legal personality have a clandestine way of uh, draining, right? So we are going to have problems when we, are, we can point out that you we can uh, apply this circumstance, right? When we have this dumping. So the active subject that is in this process to be able to apply that circumstance. Let me explain. It should be, should it be the legal representative? Can it be applied just because we are before uh, a, legal, a legal entity worker? So are we talking about the responsibility for legal personalities? This discussion is so relevant because if we check Colombian's history, we used to have with law 491 from 1999, we have this first approximation to responsibility for legal personalities. Those provisions in that law, they were analyzed by the constitutional court and won this first approximation to census 320 from 1998 in this control as the consequence of objections. And uh, Magistrate Eduardo Cifuentes we was point by the, pointed by the Constitutional Court that there couldn't be responsibility, uh, objective responsibility system. So then the question is, when can we point out when we, we have those criteria that the legal personality is conducting that activity or that assumption that establishes as an aggravation? So this was reinforced later on with C of 840 from 1999 with uh, Magistrate Alejandro Martinez. And then it was declared as an, 
this deprivation the that had the responsibility of legal personalities, not because it goes against the letter, but because there is determination against the criteria when there is imputation before the legal personality, because there is absence to criteria to impose the penalty. What is the question? When can we say that a legal personality is the one that is conducting pollution activities in relation to the application of that aggravation circumstance. That is gonna bring big discussions in our judicial practice. We also have environmental pollution because of reservoir, reservoir exploitation, hydrocarbons, no changes, illegal experimentation with biological agencies or biochemical agents. Um, one of the circumstances so that we face this criminal type. Here we go to ecological importance areas when there is invasion. Well, material objects are clarified on which this behavior can, uh, can refer to. When we look at the aggravation circumstance, the components, natural components are seriously affected. Those that were used as base to declare specifically about collective property of black communities and indigenous communities. So determining that type of property or that type of territories is not done in consideration to the natural components, but in consideration to the population uh, that uh, whose right was, was recognized. So it's a collective property for black communities or indigenous groups. It's not gonna be linked to an environmental aspects of natural resources, but in consideration to population. Therefore, this breaks with the fight, this breaks the philosophy of this law to be thought with the protection of the environment. Financing those areas for a special ecologic importance, new one. The same, we can have the same considerations for the financing and promotion of for deforestation and, and having this uh, authorship and participation that we have in the current criminal code. Article 337, illegal appropriation land in the nation. Mr. Lozada, this philosophy, this type is created. One, once we, we check it, there is no reference to the protection of these natural resources. So these in practice is gonna have implications and there will be discussions for one of the elements, the responsibility, anti-juridicity. So if we are mentioning, uh, we're locating this criminal type within and the crimes against natural resources and the environment. This is the protected good that needs to be that needs to be accredited. That at least it was in danger, uh, be, facing anti juridicity So this activity, appropriation of brownfields, uh, does not have a, a danger for natural resources or the environment. Then we would be facing the possibility for it to be declared innocent as a consequence of the absence of anti-juridicity in this concrete case, because it was not linked. The criminal type and its description was not linked to the affect, uh, affectation of natural resources. I understand the philosophy it was to avoid so that when there's appropriation of these brownfields, there would be deforestation, but we have that problem there. And the challenge when we start applying these criminal types in judicial practice. We have this criminal type. It is new also related to financing and support to illegal appropriation of brownfields to similar uh, criminal types that were created. Now we go to, we're gonna have problems because circumst uh, aggravation circumstances and those generic circumstances can already be immersed in certain criminal types. 
Therefore, authorities, uh, general prosecutor's office and, ju and judges, they need to be jealous. They need to be careful so that there are no violations because in it to the non bits in idem because if they're already in the criminal type here i'd like to focus on on this because this has been presented as one of the best and most important tools and this is the possibility of requesting whenever there are environmental crimes the cancellation or the suspension of legal personality and this will bring big, big discussions. Why? Even though there are differences from the academia to the juridical nature, some, of, some people say that it is actually a sanction. This is almost like the death of the legal personality. For others, it's just a precautionary measure. What's, what's true is that we don't have imputation criteria clear. Article 91 of the procedural code, we have the suspension or cancellation when, when, we, when the legal personality has totally or partially conducted illegal activities. But then we go back to the discussion about aggravation of environmental pollution. When we say that we are facing an activity by this legal personality. The juridical uh, can nexus of the legal representative or nexus with the employee, this has been considered from the academia as uh, the responsibility that is in, in the juridical regulations. And that is, uh, you see the quote on the bottom right in the Spanish doctrine. And we are going to start with self-responsibility criteria from the legal personality. For example, inexistence or inefficacy of protection measures inside legal uh, personalities to prevent these types of results. The absence of imputation criteria will bring great discussions because of their real possibility to, uh, to be applied. Similarly, when we look at the paragraph right there to article, Daniel, one minute left. I'm about to finish, thank you, Angela. Okay, so article 92, and this is the precautionary measure uh, to see species suspension of activities, because if we look the lo at the location, this is thought of as precautionary measures to repair for reparation. And if this is so, we are going to have these, these problems. And so if we have these measures to, to, have, a, to, to have the closure, we're going to have suitability problems so that we can have reparation measures. Lastly, we have other provisions about competence and the 36 hours. Well, I just want to say that this is an additional tool. Criminal law is not going to change the world. It will provide tools so that we can tackle it. But we also need to keep in mind more, uh, um, let's say, these measures, efficient measures to prevent. I want to finish here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel, for that complete. We know that this is a class. Yes, that's what we do. But the summary wow, was awesome. There are many questions for you in the chat. We're going to see which ones we answer in the chat and which ones we answer in public so that everyone can hear. OK, law. The law has this clear intention and there are some difficulties and a message that has been highlighted by the three panelists is criminal law is the last, is the last one. So this is, this is what we see in the questions. Uh, there are some about illegal crops. What if it's less than a hectare? Yes, because we want to get what's more, more serious. So this is my interpretation. So what would be understood as less than one hectare in natural forest, there are so many measures, previous measures, command and control that would like, uh, that could be used to solve this situation. 
Now we need to know about the interpretation by the general attorney office or and then the judicial branch for this new for this new law. So Madeline from the general attorney's office, you have 15 minutes. Thank you, everyone. For me, uh, I am very proud to be representing my institution. Daisy sends her regards, my boss. And uh, well, we're in charge of uh, natural resources and we're part of the violation of human resources, of human rights, I'm sorry. I have been allotted 15 minutes and I want to tell you that from our institutionality and my work as a prosecutor, as an attorney, well, we have, we receive this with, us. we're glad to receive this reform to the code for several reasons. First of all, because this clearly indicates that natural resources are an important topic, not only for the General Attorney's Office, but also for the Colombian state policy. The fact that this was approved, there are clear, some points are clearer than others, but approving this reform was an important message for the attorney's office, for the, for the society, for judges. It's so important for judges to be invited because we all need to understand that natural resources are not like the back door of criminal law. They're not. There are decisions that have told the state that natural resources are even more important than a human's life, even so. When you explain that to a judge uh, far, far away in the country or even in important areas of capital cities, some of them had said, don't exaggerate, dear attorney, how can you compare? the crime against a life or a sexual crime with a crime related to natural resources. So this is part of awareness. The message that is sent with this reform in the law is a clear message. And we're all saying, hey, the fact that criminal, I mean, that crimes against natural resources are not a circuit judge, not because those crimes are not important, but because now they are known by a specialized circuit. This has very important reason. And that's because we are all be facing organized, organized crime structures. Those are the ones we're facing. I don't know if everyone has understood it like that, but that's the way I see it. And I know that the prosecutor's office see it as well. And, and it was seen that way. So behind all of these activities that seem lesser, seen in a global context, like Mr. Juni said, you can see that there is a serious landscape, but be, behind those activities, there are always criminal organizations. And here, I wanna talk a little bit about what the other panelists have said. The forestation phenomenon, if we talk about deforestation mainly as one of the new crimes is a criminal phenomenon. This phenomenon is well known by everyone within the national and international context. We have contact, I mean, we, we have the problem, we see it in the context. Now let me ask you all something. This is criminal phenomenon is, has been categorized, but how to understand it? And it has two shades. One, illegal organizations, openly illegal organizations, organized armed groups and uh, FARC dissidents and so on. But there is this other side that also is an also an illegal organization, but it's part of legal activities. So when we investigate a context, an organized crime, and we focus on an organized crime, illegal organized crime, our investigation is easier, you could say, because you don't have to demonstrate before a judge that FARC dissidences are illegal. I mean, that's notorious. But when you are investigating organized crime, 
to appropriate uh, lands, uh, brownfields of the nation, there are stakeholders who are legal. There are legal activities. I am talking about the main engines for deforestation. So I'm speaking about the fact that deforestation is the means for some ends. The fact that today we have established that deforestation is an autonomous criminal type, in spite of the fact that many say, oh, but we can also have the illegal use of natural resources or damage to natural resources. I want to say no to you all. For us, it has been absolutely important because when you talk about the legal use of natural resources, you have to have the behavior of those organizations, link them, those legal criminal organizations that, are, are, that have legal activities, but they have this um, sinister uh, end, which is part of promoting deforestation to appropriate lands so that they can have cattle or they can have legal uh, crops, I don't know, palm or others. But when you're facing those phenomena, then it's, link, it's difficult to link deforestation to that legal personality or the natural person who nowadays is um, a known cattle man, cattle woman. So when you cannot have that evidence connection, it's very difficult to demonstrate that that activity, legal activity, is linked to deforestation. So then we go, we, we had to go to the legal use of natural resources or we had to go to natural resource damage. And we saw this very difficult topic that it was to demonstrate authorship. If we could demonstrate damage, and we sometimes we can even demonstrate damage because getting to territories was not easy. Experts need to get to the place, but with the forestation, with satellite images is enough to say, well, one hectare was deforested. I don't have to go, I don't have to take the experts like Mr. Junis mentioned, getting to territories is not easy. Getting to an area implies actually operational expenses, very high ones, to be able to have an expert's opinion that says, yes, we have damage. But with deforestation, I, I think I have not applied it, but with a satellite images, uh, we can have evidence that certain number of uh, hectares were the part of deforestation. So I don't need to demonstrate use, illegal use, like the illegal use of natural resources, extract, introduce, manage, capture, access, access. The only thing I need to demonstrate is that there was deforestation for one, two, 15 hectares in the forest. From that viewpoint, when we analyze the phenomenon from criminal organizations, those who act legally or for legal business in this country, I believe that it's gonna be easier to demonstrate that that deforestation is linked to that company or to that natural person that has 100 hectares of eucalyptus or has 100 pieces of cattle in this area that was deforested uh, some, some months before. Some topics worry me. I'm not gonna repeat what Daniel said, but I want to say that with this, these crimes that are related to deforestation, they are, they're almost all of them are related to corruption. Corruption of territorial institutions, several institutions, you have said it, criminal law is the last one, and then a burden is inverted. We are assuming that we are the first missionality that needs to correct the problem. Here, I want to speak about environmental authorities, those who have to exert, exert control in the territory. Let's not forget about something very difficult, a difficult topic. I must say it like this, corruption, serious corruption. And unfortunately, uh, I suggested when they asked me about this law modification, I suggested that criminal types 
that are in admin in justice administration titles and in those that are related to public administration uh, had to be aggravated when they were linked to criminal types related to the environment because of a reason because unfortunately in all those activities that we are developing in our investigations we have found that there is always this administrative act that is legalizing an activity which was primarily illegal so we found that those activities unfortunately are linked to public administration or administrative corruption but we can we cannot prove environmental crime but we can prove uh public administration for example so we are a little bit weak in the sense that we should have uh, gotten uh, penalties in public administration when they were related to environmental topics similarly i would like to tell you that within the context of the uh, reading that we have in the law the fact that sentences were increased um well it's interesting for us because these investigations are very difficult when we are talking about these structures or when we're talking about criminal organizations they are very very difficult and to be able to demonstrate this illegal use of natural resources has the sentence of 48 months of prison and when once charges are accepted well the sentence is not you know it's not there if you cannot link it to to public administration we we have this uh, just environment and you know you you feel pain for those that are in those so those sentences that are so low about financing Daniel mentioned about this. There is this topic about wording, but we must say that financing in deforestation and in this area, importance, ecologic importance, that is the most serious problem that we have in the Amazonic, in the Amazon. You, unfortunately, we are we are there we're trying to get yeah sorry we're trying to get to uh, we go beyond but it's not easy so trying to connect that financing with those uh, important areas or deforestation well this autonomous crime could have been aggravation I apologize for the microphone, but it was necessary. This is just about policy. So what it needs to be, the same thing about brownfield appropriation. This is one of the ends of deforestation. There is something else. I don't know if I'm too altruist, but there is this verb tolerate to in this, this verb in this criminal type tolerate obliges other institutions, state institutions like the National Land Agency, like many institutions to do their job. Because unfortunately, we have to say it, we have to investigate many public servants who do not comply with their, um, with their mission, with their position, their duties, and then natural resources damage our cost. That's why it was so important to have this because of a mission when complying with the authorities because there is this bottleneck, great bottleneck. So besides that verb to tolerate, there is something. Colombia, we don't, we, uh, these brown fields are not defined. So how can we say that they are taken if we don't know which ones they are, which we don't know, but they're not delimited. So it's important to have this criminal type of truth be said, I think it's difficult to apply. And for, well, however, I, well, in spite of this, I'm looking at this criminal type to tolerate, and I'm trying to investigate 
with the purpose of establishing if we could have this type of illegal appropriation of brownfields. My time is almost up, right, Angela? Yes. I just want to say something else about Article 5th, added by Article, well, in Article 92. Yeah. There are some errors. A legislative technique, it shouldn't have been there because of the title it was under, but it is absolutely important for us to request for a judge to suspend an activity because the environmental authority does not do it and they should. So when we are facing, for example, landfills, right? Deeply important, they cause deterioration to natural resources. We see that activities continue, 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 of course. They have other problems to suspend the activity, but this is just to give you an example. My time's up. I know that speaking about these topics, about structured investigation, legal, illegal, I call them legal, some of them, because of the activities that they conduct. It does not sound pretty. Um, sometimes we don't like it so much, but that's the reality. I want to tell you, the numbers shown by Mr. Junis show increasing deforestation in the Amazon forest from 2017, 2018. Just in Guaviare, the increase was something exaggerated. There is a reason for being, it because this was a political decision of those in the administration back then. So I want to call your attention. When this, when there is someone in the administration that does not respect the natural resources that they, they, they don't care about it, so they go and they make decisions that go against this. And I'm talking about illegal, ro I mean, it's having these roads and there is this impossibility of recovering territory because there is this social umbrella. My last thing related to social umbrella, I don't know where it is, but there is invasion of uh, these areas of importance if there are peasants, no, wait, yeah, appropriation of brownfields. So if there are peasants, indigenous or African descendants, well, unfortunately, those are the instruments, peasants, they are the ones, they were they great in, invaders. They are instrumentalized. They are the instruments. We're going to have a serious problems as the general attorney's office. Thank you, Madeline, so much for your intervention. It's so interesting to know about this perspective. And there are many observations and interests and needs to get to analyze from the perspective each person has. There are some questions in the chat. We're gonna have our Q&A session. And now we invite Jessica from the judicial criminal viewpoint, the perspectives about this new environmental crimes law. Thank you, Angela Maria. I would like to thank Mr. Birch and Angela Maria for this invitation. When Angela introduced me, she said that I was the star judge. <sighs> and she says that because I have tried to participate in all courses, diploma courses and everything they have had with this great effort to train us. I am a guarantee control judge in Magdalena in Santa Marta. I, I have experience, great experience, because I was also an attorney, a local section, section and specialized attorney. And I went to judicature and she says that because that my participation in these courses they have offered is because I really, I really realized that environmental law, I didn't know anything about it. In the first class I was with 
Mr. Cardona and with Mr. Guzman, with, uh, I told them, oh, we really don't have this training besides updating about environmental law. So we as judges, and I as a guarantee control judge, we always focused on criminal law, procedural law, and this environmental law, like uh, Madeleine said before, me, is always seen as something of little importance because in regions, at least in Magdalena department, there are very few people who are sentenced for these types of crimes. This took me to want to learn, to study, to know, and I have to start, I should have started by knowing what environmental law was. So I found that criminal law can be defined as the set of regulations related with human rights behavior, human behavior and interaction with nature to protect, safeguard the correct cycle of nature and avoid deterioration, avoid serious damage, irreversible damage, so that human activities, technological, scientific activities and the development of any uh, human activity can be materialized without in having deterioration of nature. Besides, I found that in environmental law, there are two visions. <laughs> the first one is this classic view, is this classic view from Western culture, and this is in the inter international, but since the environmental law started or was born, and is having environmental law or the protection that derives to service that nature provides to human beings, the benefit ecosystems, animals, trees, provide to humans the concept of natural resources. This, imply, this implies that this is seen as an appropriable object, nature that can be used, that can be exploited, and there is ownership of it. In our constitution, nature is spoken of as a resource, as wealth, something appropriable, that it has value because of humans. Why should we protect Earth, because if it's gone, well, we wouldn't be able, human race wouldn't be able to, to live. So the view that we need nature, water, natural resources to live for human beings is an anthropocentric view. I also found a vision, yeah, a vision that is developed from biocentric or ecocentric conception. Nature must be protected, not for the benefit that it provides for human beings, not saying, oh, we're gonna run out of water and we won't be able to live for trees or oxygen or all of these ecosystems, but the existence of human right of human beings, but the rights nature possesses itself. So nature is not seen as an object, but as a subject of rights. At the regional level, I'd like to say in America, Latin America, some countries have changed their approach on nature. Ecuador is an example in 2008, they modified the constitution and they established that nature was understood as a subject of rights. And I really like Bolivia's example. In 2010, they have this law that is called the rights of Mother Earth. Mother Earth is understood as nature is a collective subject of rights. I thought that was wow. So this is a changing point, a game changer to understand environmental law from the biocentric or ecocentric viewpoint. 
We need to protect nature, not for the benefits that it provides for us as human beings, because we need nature to, to, to live for our species to continue, but because of those rights that go for nature itself. Bolivia's law mentions this uh, vital cycle of nature in which human beings should not interfere. These concepts, for me, it's like I'm just, thanks to, to, to the courses I've taken that I've taken, I'm just starting to understand environmental law and I'm just like diving into these topics. To me, this is a, I don't know, it's, it's marvelous, it's so good. And I can understand, for example, the ruling for also Chucho ruling habeas corpus to defend Chucho bear, remember the bear? And um, when they invited me to that meeting, I spoke with Angela and I, I told Angela, I am going to talk about the law. And, and she says, no, no, no. We just want to see your view from judicature. So I believe that this is the vision that judicature should have, or that's where we should move towards as a country. And to understand that the environment is not important only because it provides benefits to human beings, but because of the rights nature has itself. From here on, well, I have revised, not, not, prof not profound, right? It's superficial with all these uh, regulations. And I also looked at the international uh, approach. So it was the environmental block. Those international instruments, and there is unfortunate surprise. And I saw how Colombia didn't, has not subscribed the Escazú Agreement. We haven't. In our constitution, for example, what we see is that the environment or the nature, like I said at the beginning with this approach, with this approach where human beings are what matter, we found that in the constitution, Nature is a good, as a natural resource, a resource for human beings, but not because nature itself has rights. Well, this is uh, what Angela asked from me, this view, not that we judges have, it's not the judges, it's not the, the viewpoint we have because by listening to Madeleine and I agree with her, and I am so sure that as I went through the attorney's office because of guarantee control judges of having this remote place in the country is not only preached about from judicature. We, it is preached about all institutions, even the attorney's office, because I worked so many years at the attorney's office and these crimes against the environment, I was, I was there at the General Attorney's Office uh, 10 years ago, and I was there for 15 years. So uh, environmental laws and utilization because of environmental crimes was very little, very, very, very few cases, sentences. We, as a society, have not given the importance that it should actually have. I'm talking about the environment. Now, what's coming as judicature? I believe that we as judicature have a challenge, a very important challenge for, uh, for resource protections to become material, the ones that we have in the criminal code, we must have tools, teeth, and those teeth Unfortunately, in our society, and I absolutely agree that it's the last one, 
we have criminal law well, as ultima ratio, but the first option, it's not the last option to solve or to um, have a halt on these situations. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, I traveled to Barranquilla and I realized how that road, they have these fires, they have these burns. This is deforestation. I saw those burns. Why? Well, because they wanted to appropriate those lands or they wanted to destine those portions to cattle or to growing other species. And I say, hey, where? Where is authorities' action here in the region? I don't know if what Madeleine talked to us about, about this being a crime, a specialized crime, this is good or if this on the contrary is going to judicialize big deforestations to say it somehow when it's only one when it's a hectare or more hey and what happens with those little pieces of land with those invasive invaders when they are little by little having deforestation because they don't burn one hectare they have 5,000 meters, five, 3,000 meters. So where, where is authorities' actions or where are authorities' actions at the local level, at territories, in regions? That's where we see damage to environment. For judicature, I believe the challenge is that in those judicial decisions, for them to have an impact, transcendence, those decisions ought to be clear, simple, precise. They must bind keeping in mind social and economic factors. Those decisions should be opportune. Those are the challenges the judicial branch has, at least in the criminal law. They need to be opportune, they need to be transcending, they need to be impartial, fair and inclusive. They must be dictated by independent judges. And you well know that this is a challenge and justice administration has is to keep themselves independent. And for this, judges need to be trained. We need to have knowledge on the environmental issues. That's why this topic is so important for me. I'm not just gonna keep myself with the courses I, I have been able to attend. And this must also go to all judges because guarantee control judges, it could be in any municipalities, those far away municipalities, like Miss Ms. Paris said. So for these decisions to be opportune, transcendent, so that they comply, are complied with, those judges need to have their training. We don't have those training now. So for these decisions, to have transcendence or factors that block or those factors that um, don't allow effectiveness, compliance terms are too short or too long. The lack of integration of environmental aspects with socioeconomical ones, the use of little developed concepts by doctrine. I think that in Colombia, we are lacking many things in environmental matters. Complex decisions. Judges assume roles that uh, should be handled by administrative authorities or district authorities or even legislator difficulty to comply with uh, sentences because of lack of budget and technical institutions to execute them. 
And the main problem in environmental law is lack of effectiveness. If we, as judges, don't set a task for those decisions that we make, administrative law, criminal law, any area, if these decisions are not effective, little will be done to protect the environment. I think that my intervention has to be the shortest oh, because those, of, uh, those who spoke before me spoke broadly and Angela asked me to give my perspective from a judge, not from all judges, from a judge, but at least from my viewpoint, this is the perspective that I have about this. Thank you. El manejo del tiempo también estuvo perfecto. Muchísimas gracias por esa visión y por ese llamado como a la sensibilización. Que digamos... Perfect timing. Okay, this is, awareness is the main object of the project. And, and here I want to like advertise and is getting judges close to environmental drug thing that already exists in the country. Of course, there are other countries that are more developed in that sense, but juridical environmental doctrine in Colombia is extense, but, but it is focused on the academia. So what we're trying with this project and what we've seen, we also have Daniel, he has sat down to work with me. So it's not the same thing to have teach class in a specialization or a master's program than to teach judges. So how to, to convey that information to those of you who are experts, not necessarily in environmental issues. So that's the view we want to convey. So we're in the good path. Now, last half an hour to solve some of the questions that have come up in the chat or through private messages. I would like to clarify that we cannot answer all of them. They're not easy to answer. They don't all have the immediate answer. And those are cases that require a lot of analysis and interpretation. We also have jurisprudence, how they can give us a hand to understand these topics. I would like to ask Mr. Lozada, can you hear us at this moment? Something that has mentioned, and also in several uh, different uh, social topics, that those areas where we have these uh, operations, this is the sentence that I use, our, our forests are not empty, people live there. Not all the forestation processes, not all are supported by criminal organizations. We saw data presented by Jose Junis where, with, with precision, where there is a deforestation in great scale and then this other lesser scale. So how this typification is effective against violent actors or organized crime or a nod that goes for it to go against uh, livelihoods of peasant communities? Thank you. I would like to thank everybody's uh, interventions. I understand controversy a project like this can generate. Not only from the, the from criminal dogmatic or juridical dogmatic, but the questions as the one that asks that, that is asked here. Articles have the answer. It was clear there that these wouldn't go against communities, uh, against African descendants communities or indigenous people. Daniel said that this is not about just any type of logging or burning. This must have a continuity in time and area measures or measurement so that this is object for the criminal law. That legitimate concern 
those uh, the abuse of the public force with some communities like Junus said like in Mapiripan for example and yes the whole community protested and they were financed by uh, uh, those 8,000 hectares that um, activity you could think about that but they are not generated from the law what i believe is that these aims are regulating a social problem that is so complex this complexity that is difficult to understand for all of us i believe that the law establishes a difference between activities related to peasants, indigenous peoples, and African descendants that has a difference between logging with what deforestation is. And of course, I need to agree with many of you, those that, but the, there is this need, not like I had said it, like this training for judges and attorneys, but this social dialogue, big social dialogue. This is the challenge as Colombia's state where this, where the forestation is occurring. Social dialogue capacity. I regret that that's not a quality by the, it is not a quality by the uh, Colombian state. This is not a political political forum. But one must remember that those areas where there is high deforestation, there is leaders, there are leaders killing, social leaders, environmental leaders have been murdered. For example, what happened in Cauca, that's dramatic. Over two years, I mean, in Madeline, there is not one park ranger in, in Pikachu. There isn't one, not even one park ranger. This, this is just, uh, there are multinationals that buy milk from those uh, pieces of cattle like Nestle. French NGOs, it's not even us. They somehow had this claim how Casino was buying beef that comes from natural parks, deforestation, national parks. There is no way of having territorial control. One can criticize this Artemisa operation. This goes beyond. This goes beyond Artemisa operation. There was not the legislator willingness to judicialize peasants, judicialize people who needed logging to for substance to survive. What we do know, like Junus said, we need this law to be operational in those cases. It is necessary to do it. What happened between Calamar and Miraflores is something that cannot be understood from any perspective. What happened in Mapiripan is not acceptable. What is happening in Chiribiquete is not acceptable. It is not acceptable. And here we need to have to look at reality. Mr. Junus did not mention it, but at least out of 12 municipalities where IDEAM has determined that over 60% of the forestation in the country is focused, there are seven out of those 12, of those 12 that you can match cattle growth with deforestation growth. San Vicente del Caguan, Cartagena del Chaira. And what you cannot understand is that Colombian state legalizes these environmental problems with the investment in roads to get the production of those beef producers that come from the most serious deforestation. So there, there are indications. We know perfectly what to do, where the focus is. We know who's behind this. What is missing is political willingness to stop this, this uh, craziness. I want to close with this. 
by saying that yesterday in the general budget, there was something history in the nation budget. Forest monitoring by IDEAM now has resources by the nation. That program, the one that can determine priorities for public policy in these matters to international cooperation that one day can be there, next day they cannot. This administration wants to have deforestation, the, the fight against deforestation, the focus cannot happen because there are no resources to even maintain the program. We have had more results to try to understand the phenomenon. So this is my proposal that now the National Planning Department will transfer resources to them for a forest and carbon monitoring system. There's so many topics, they're so interconnected. I apologize if I don't have, I'm not as organized to answer in this intervention, but I hope to have been able to partially at least answer the question and have been complemented with topics related that are key. And just to tell you that I agree with uh, Jessica Storino, my view is not anthropocentric. That's why we have insisted on constitutionalization of natural rights. I intervene not only the constitutional case in Chucho Bear, but there is this bill that has never advanced because of time. So in Colombia, we're trying to do the same thing that was done in Bolivia and Ecuador to guarantee for, for, so that this is not because of humans interests, but as humans, we can acknowledge that we're part of Earth and not vice versa. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah, everything is connected. Something that I have seen in the questions in the chat is that concern. Typification for this crime may turn into over criminalization of those traditional activ activities by peasants. It is a clear message, those who have spoken today. Criminal law is the last option. There are other strategies. We have Amazon Vision. Jose, before boarding the airplane, he asked me to insist on this. Like Amazon Vision and other strategies are before there so that behavior don't get to the forestation. So criminal law is there, it exists. There is this tool that we need to have, but it will be the last tool because uh, well, because the others uh, work first. Two questions for Daniel. They are connected. The question is, what responsibility would financial institutions have if they finance deforestation as occupation of brownfields for cattle? And this other connection, what would happen with FEDEGAN, the Cattle Federation that finance civil pastoral uh, activities? Yeah, so the question is so interesting. It's so interesting because we have great discussions. We have identified and we see the applicable criminal type. One could think, in principle, it shouldn't be understood that here Daniel is trying to go after an institution. No. In principle, one could think of criminal type to promote and finance deforestation. We must have it clear that this is this is um, this criminal type guilt, right? So we have these discussions to apply the criminal type, who, who this crime will be given to? Because this is a common crime, and since this is a common crime, we cannot apply this clause. So one cannot think that because automatically we're gonna think about the legal representative of the financial institution or X activity that is promoting or financing X or such activity. That's the first discussion. 
from the general attorney's office and judicature this criteria imputation, right? Imputation criteria. Objective one in business organizations. There is this important challenge in terms of training, but we go back to the discussion. In those hypotheses, one could think about suspending the legal personality of that financial activity since they developed a crime, a crime, or they conducted a crime, they suspension and canceling the legal personality or closing business says is worrisome, not, not only in environmental crimes, but in any type of crimes, because if one checks Article 91, it is not limited to environmental issues. So if we check compared law, Argentinian legislation, this only applies for when society was created to commit crimes. This illegal object in the Spanish one, uh, just dissolving this legal personality only exists and it cannot be applied when there is, uh, when the crime is repeated, when there was a previous sentence because of the same type of crime. The same thing happens with the Chilean legislation. But like I tell you here, we don't have clear criteria when to impose these types of measures. And that's where we have to have this big discussion from the academia that will translate to judicature. And this is the possibility of applying these types of measures against legal personalities, financial institutions, or other natures that somehow can end up participating in deforestation promotion activities. In principle, one could think about that criminal type with the discussions as to who the imputation is, and also the discussion about the possibility of applying those types of measures, such as the cancellation of the legal personality. I hope I have answered. Thank you, Daniel. There are new questions or concerns for other sectors that thought that, like Madeline said, that was like the like the back patio, the backyard. I have a question for Madeline. This is something that has been very, has created a uh, polemic. Yeah, so let me read it. Mrs. Perez, do you believe that Artemisa operation has judicialized the big um, actors or stakeholders in the first station? Thank you, thank you for that question. Artemisa operation has been stigmatized. Artemisa operation has provided many elements and physical evidence that today have taken us to know who the back men are, the back office are, who are the hoarders, who are the ones who hire peasants, who are promoting, who uh, the owners are, or who have created companies to hoard cattlemen, big cattlemen that who, we didn't know because we hadn't been able to get to territory. So because of Artemisa operation, I always give the example of micro-trafficking with tra drug trafficking. When one wants to get to the head or to the structure or mid-level of the structure, because it's not easy to get to the head or to heads, because it's not only one, micro-trafficking, we, all, we usually start from the back door, the back patio, the lower structure, to get up there, higher in the structure. So when you capture a small trafficker, you get most of the cases and you, most of the cases you receive relevant information that gets you, this information gets you to the higher levels in the criminal structure. I want to tell you about environment. When you hire a driver who, I don't know, 25 cubic meters of any type of wood, you say, Oh, you say, oh, he's just a driver. He didn't know. So when you investigate the crime deeply and you have contact with that person, he will provide irrelevant information that will take you to the public servant who had the fake mobilization permit, the person who is behind the wood. So Artemisa operation has been stigmatized because uh, it's stigmatized 
prioritized because peasants have been captured, we need to obtain information from them. They are the ones who are there at the site where the crime occurred. But to answer another question, Artemisa operation, most cases we have had principles opportunity, right? That, uh, for example, with the collaboration or so Artemisa operation has been successful from the investigation viewpoint. Thank you, Madeleine. I was speaking with Daniel. We have a question about the opportunity principle and you just answered it. We won't be able to answer all questions uh, here live, but some of them are answered already in the chat. Jessica, from the perspective that you have analyzed, how could the ethnic community or peasant community context that lives of the forest in a sentence related to deforestation or in a sentence that we've seen different types of judicial actions, but how to make it compatible to incorporate the community visions when there are deforestation processes. How to incorporate the view? Yeah, ethnic community. Oh, okay. Well, mm, more than incorporating, we need to see whether exploitation they conduct, yeah, exploitation they have for the forestation, if it truly belongs to the cosmopolitan view. I believe that these communities are a lot more respectful of the environment. I don't see how these communities cause deforestation. I don't know if I don't understand the question pretty well. So how to incorporate that vision to the sentence? Well, I believe that they must be trained in the sense that these activities damage environment, the environment. I don't understand the question pretty well, but how though that vision can be incorporated to, to judicial sentences? Yes, I think that the way you analyze it is very interesting. These communities have a different relationship the way we see it, right? The way we see it through different participation mechanisms within judicial procedures when legally, when it legally corresponds to include communities' visions. This is very important because these communities fight to protect the environment. So it'd be very important to keep in mind that view of land to protect to protect the environment in each sentence. That would be enriching, I would I would think so. I totally agree with you, Jessica. That's one of the important topics that we will address in our second webinar that is related to uh, legal clinics. You wanted to say something else? No, well, actually, I did not mention something related to decisions guarantee control judges can make. Madeline talked about that. And now speaking about legal personalities, especially con guarantee control judges, we can uh, provide orders or sentences uh, to protect at least a precautionary protection in uh, the environment, suspending an activity, just like Madeline said. So, those are in nominated orders. We could take hand of or, or yeah, use those precautionary measures to be able to protect the environment by stopping an activity, right? Madeline explained that and I like that. And I was, well, there was this doubt about this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass on the floor to Daniel. His hand is up. One more minute, Daniel, and then we'll close the seminar. Yes, well, 
the question asked to Jessica, we must remember um, turtle meat uh, in the terminal, at the transportation terminal in Bogota. Let's remember that. There was this error acknowledging that there was an impossibility in the concrete case, and those are con discussions in the concrete case to understand that that behavior was prohibited. Just to add that little point and the possibility of going to the error that, that, that culturally um, protected. I was about to close, but there is this so interesting question and Madeline wants to answer it. So one minute, Madeline. We need to answer it because I think that the context is important. So with modification of law 2111, a judge could order closing roads, right? That derived, whose construction derived in deforestation. And the person who asks the reopening Le Chica La Mira Flores Road. Madeline told us that she was the one, she was the attorney who requested the measure. One minute. Yes, maximum two. That question is so important because it even solves other questions that are there. When I requested the protection measure, to the environment, I did it based on the sentence that grants uh, jungle, the Amazon jungle as the subject of rights. So I had this precautionary measure. I thought this was the most innovative thing because nobody had asked for it. And I asked the guarantee, uh, the guarantee control judge to close the road. I want to tell you that wasn't like the last resource because the environmental, the environmental authority had already ordered that. So when I requested that, I need to have the structured analysis. I need to talk about the protection measure. But today, with this new law, is a lot easier, right? We just use it and we request closing the road. Why has it been such a problem? So, so because of uh, like this problem, because of the social issue. I want to tell you that unfortunately, we think that when having ordered close and linking three majors, one with capture order because of environmental, because they opened that road illegally, but also because of public administration. The other two majors, we just had the imputation because of damage and invasion to natural resources. We thought that that judicial decision was going to lower the forestation levels. And unfortunately, I have to say it didn't deforestation continued increasing. So we see how criminal law is not the option. So we asked another road to be closed then in Caño Mosco. One year ago, I requested that and the guarantee control judge granted it. And from there, there is this territorial control by the army and the police. They need to make it effective. But, but yeah, with the new law, it's a lot easier. Madeline, thank you so much to include that answer. It's so important because it connects with other questions about the rights of nature and what applications they could have. I would like to thank everyone. We have complied with today's objective. It was a very interesting, complete discussion, even with the, little, with the time we had from different perspectives and the importance of the law. I'd like to thank all panelists everyone from ELI, they're always here. So we're always trying so, so that nothing just goes by. So to respect everyone's, everyone's, everyone who participates. Please register for the next two webinars, next two Thursdays, clinical, yeah, th those legal clinics in the United States and legal clinics in Colombia, November 4th procedural topics such as environmental justice uh, challenges, magistrates, defenders, different perspectives. That's what we want to integrate views from different fields. I hope it was interesting. We are going to be disseminating information through social networks. Have a good night, everyone. Goodbye.